The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Has anyone ever phoned you to check up on what radio program you're listening to? It happens like this. Yes? This is the Radio Checking Bureau. Is your radio turned on? Why, yes, it is. What program are you listening to, please? Well, it's... This is your FBI. Just starting. Do you know who sponsors that program? Oh, sure I do. It's the Equitable Life Assurance Society. I listened last week and heard about the Equitable Society's fact-finding charts for fathers and mothers. Uh, my representative brought me a copy. So naturally, I know that This Is Your FBI is sponsored by the Equitable Society. In about 15 minutes, I'll be back with full information about the Equitable Society's fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Tonight's FBI file, The Slapstick Holdup. America, as was to be expected, has changed in a quarter of a century. The movies people were seeing then, movies like Bo Brummel and The Ten Commandments, were silent. F. Scott Fitzgerald was at work on a book called The Great Gatsby. And throughout the country in large cities and small towns, people were seeing road companies of plays like Laugh Clown Laugh, Stepping Stones, and, of course, The Student Prince. In every city, even the split week stands, there was something which today has all but vanished from the American scene. There was the theatrical boarding house. Actors lived there while they were in town and, as sometimes happened, stayed on if the show closed in that particular place. There are very few of those boarding houses left, a few scattered here and there, but wherever you find one, you will find people like the ones you meet tonight in... Our case from the files of your FBI, people like the Guy Greens. Tonight's file opens in a rear bedroom of just such a boarding house located in a large western city. An attractive, dark-haired girl is putting on her makeup as the door opens. Hey, Ginger, I just thought of a good joke for the opening spot. Uh-huh. Listen to this. I walk out cold, see? No music, no nothing. And I say, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And then when nobody answers, I say, you got no manners at all. I just said good evening. <laughs> uh-huh. Well, that warms them up, see? Then I say, look, I know there are people out there. I can hear them breathing. <laughs> you like it, baby? Sure. But where are you going to use it? Huh? You don't need jokes. You need jobs. Oh, now, Ginger, don't start that again. Look, there'll be work. When? Well, I saw Nelson when I was out. He wants me back at the hotel for the summer. But that's almost six months away. What do we use for bread till then? Well, maybe I can get a couple of weeks from Sid Piermont. Oh, you wrote to him before Christmas. If he was going to book you, you'd have heard from him by now. Well, maybe the letter got lost. I'll write him again. Hey, when the variety come? In the afternoon mail. What's in it? Did you read it? I fan through it. Sinatra struck oil in Wyoming. Oh, good. The kid needs it. Guy. Huh? Mrs. Olson stopped by again while you were out to ask about the rent. Uh Uh-huh. She says unless she gets at least a piece of what we owe her, she'll have to ask us to move. Uh Uh-huh. Guy, you're not listening to me. Guy, will you please put down that paper and... Hey, Ginger. Huh? Did you see this? What? The nightclub reviews. I don't want to talk about nightclub reviews. Look, you remember that baggy pants comic who worked at the hotel with me last summer, Eddie Manley? Yeah. Well, did you see the review here? No wonder he's working. What are you mumbling about? Why, that bum stole my whole act. Listen to this notice. He does an imitation of Hildegard. 
He does the wrestler on the telephone talking to the man at the television station. He does the old lady talking back to the radio. Hey, no wonder I can't get bookings. He must be ruining the material. Well, I got one break anyhow. What's that? The bum is working right here in town. Where? At the Palms. You know that joint out on the road by the lake? Yeah. Well, nobody's going to steal Guy Green's act and get away with it. Why don't you write to AGVA? They can stop him. I can stop him myself. I'm going out there and see him right now. Hello, Ralph. Oh, Pete. I didn't see you come in. Well, I had dinner in town tonight. I figured I'd look in on my way home to see how everything was coming. Every time you do this, there's never any business. You gotta remember it's right after Christmas, Pete. People got no money left. I didn't stop by to talk about the business here. Have you heard anything yet from Chuck? Oh. No, it ain't time yet. He ain't due here for like, oh, 20 minutes yet. Job set for 8 o'clock on the button. Well, I hope he does this one right. I laid the whole thing out like a rug for him. Chuck is okay, so long as he doesn't have to do any thinking. He can't go wrong on this one, a plain stick-up. Uh, I guess you're right. Yeah, sure. Look, uh... Why don't we, uh... Why don't we what? Well, let's get down the road and see how business is up there, huh? Hey. All right. Hey. Yeah? What's this? Which one of you guys is Pete Craig? Well, I am. They tell me you own this joint, huh? Well, I'm Guy Green, and I want to talk to you about Eddie Manley. Who? Eddie Manley, the comedian you got working here. He's using all my material, and it's got to stop. Uh, Ralph, you take care of this, will you? Yeah, sure, Pete. Now, look, you're not giving me any quick brush off. What do you think? You're playing with kids? Well, you must think you are. You're wasting your time, brother. I fired Eddie Manley for coming in drunk an hour ago. Well, you still got his billing outside. I ain't had time to take it down yet. Oh, you're a liar. You're covering up for it. Uh, Ralph, what are you wasting your time with this bum for? Call Toots and tell him to throw the creep out. <laughs> A few minutes later, in front of the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is waiting for a car being driven by Agent Frank Landon. He sees it approach. Hi, Frank. Hi, Jim. Uh, sorry I had to get you away from dinner, Frank. Oh, that's all right, Jim. SAC assigned us to work together on a case that just came in. Oh. Every minute might be important. Well, what kind of a case is it? Uh, Frank, turn right at the next corner, will you? Head for Route 35. And where are we going? Watertown. What kind of a case is this, Jim? You see the stories in this afternoon's papers about young John Anderson getting married? Mm hmm. Well, then you probably also saw the pictures of the collection of jewelry the bride got from Anderson's parents. Yeah. Well, so did a stick up man. Anderson and his bride were held up 15 minutes ago. Well, how do we get in on a hold up, Jim? It happened on the train that they were taking to California. Uh -huh. They took the 740 out of here. Well, the newspapers really made Anderson and his bride a target with those pictures. I sure did. Well, when the train was 20 minutes out of the station, the Andersons heard a knock on the door of the drawing room. Mm -hmm. They opened the door, the bandit stepped in, pulled a gun, and took every piece of jewelry the bride had with her. Hmm. Any description on what the bandit looked like? No, he's wearing a mask. It looked like a large handkerchief with a green border. All we know is that he was a big man, about six feet, two inches tall, that he's heavy set. Mm -hmm. How come we're going to Watertown? The 740 doesn't stop there. Well, the bandit jumped off the train right near Watertown. Immediately after the holdup, he pulled the emergency cord, stopped the train, and got away. Oh. The train made a special stop at Watertown so that Anderson and his bride could get off there and wait for us. Well, where are we going to meet them? Police headquarters. Well, this whole thing happened just 15 minutes ago, Jim. The trail should still be pretty warm. Yeah. Let's just hope it's warm enough to lead us right to the bandit. <laughs> Officer. Yeah, George. Uh, there's a man waiting for you in your office. Who is it? Well, he said to tell you his name, Mr. Chuck. Oh, thanks, George. Clear up the table. I won't be back in a while. Yes, sir, Mr. Officer. Hello, Chuck. Hi, Ralph. Uh, brother, am I glad to see you. I'm glad to get back here. Where you been? Pete was here. He waited for you. Where's he now? He went home. Oh? He wants me to call him as soon as I see what you got, so let's take a look at it. Okay. How'd it go? Okay. The way you been all this time? I had some trouble after I got the stuff. What happened? The guy stood still while I grabbed all of the jewelry, but I started to take a big rock off the dame's finger. He threw a punch at me. You didn't shoot him, did you? No, but I slugged him and the dame started to scream. Then what happened? I shoved all the stuff in this little valise they had, ran out, pulled the emergency cord. The train stopped, they jumped off. 
Where were you when you jumped off? I don't know. Well, how did you get here? I heisted a car. You didn't leave a hot car out in the parking lot, did you? No, 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 no. I drove it up into the woods behind the joint. I'll get rid of it later. I hate to call Pete and tell him this. He ain't gonna like it. Well, he'll like it when you tell him what I got in this valise. Hey, wait till I show you. Now, tell me he ain't gonna like that. Oh, yeah, yeah. That stuff is beautiful. Hey, are you gonna tell me where Eddie Manley is? I've been looking for him all over this crib. He ain't at the bar. He ain't in his dressing room. Come on, where are you hiding him? Who is this guy, Ralph? He's a bum I had thrown out of here an hour ago. Yeah, and I'm gonna keep coming back until you let me see Manley. He stole my act, and he ain't going to get away with it. And you're not going to help him get away with it either. Well, tell him that right now. How? Well, there he is, and back here. Where? No! <laughs> Sucker. Frank, what were you able to get from Anderson and his bride? Nothing we didn't already know, Jim. She's still pretty hysterical. Mm. Oh, I drove down to where the train stopped when the emergency cord was pulled. Yeah, did you find anything? Yeah, some footprints leading away from the train. Well, we might get something from that. Oh, I made some casts of the prints. They're in the back of the car. We can drop them at the lab when we go back to the office. Huh? Uh-huh. Well, the ground ought to be pretty soft out there after all the rain we've been having. <laughs> it is. Take a look at my shoes. <laughs> How far were you able to follow the prints? Oh, for about a half a mile. I couldn't follow them once they reached the highway, though. That's uh, Highway 73, isn't it? Yeah, that's it. And were you right near the bridge when the footprints ended? Yeah. Yeah, how did you know? Because I think I can pick up the trail at that point. Oh, how? And just before you came in, Jim, we got a report that a 1947 black Buick convertible was stolen on that road. Come on, let's send out a statewide alarm. <laughs> Who is it? Me, Ralph. Oh. Okay, just a minute. Well, come in, come in. Say, is your phone out of order? Well, no, why? Well, I hate to bother you at home, but I've been calling you from the joint for 20 minutes. Your line was always busy. Oh, well, I, uh, I was talking to a couple of guys in Florida. Oh. Well, how did Chuck make out? That's what I came over to tell you about. Something go wrong again? No, not exactly, Pete. It just didn't go 100% the way we planned. What happened this time? Well, a chump put up a fight. Chuck had to belt him. When the dame started to scream, Chuck pulled the emergency cord to stop the train. Uh-huh. Then, instead of taking a cab to the joint from the station like we planned, he heisted a car. Well, that's not too bad. That ain't the real trouble. What do you mean? Remember the bum who came in to see you tonight about Eddie Manley? Yeah, yeah. Chuck and I were in the office. We had the loot spread all over the desk. He busted in looking for Manley again. Did he see the stuff? He must have. <sighs> what happened? I conked him, tied him up. He's in the closet in the office. Chuck's there to see that he don't get away. Well, we got a problem. If we let that stiff go, the first thing he does is run right to the cops. No contest about that. You better tell Toots to take care of him. Okay, I figured you'd want to do that, but I wanted to talk to you before I gave Toots the go-ahead. Say, wait a minute, wait a minute. I just thought of something. What? This, uh, this all fits in pretty good. That guy in the closet is just about Chuck's size, right? That's right. Where's the car that Chuck stole after he jumped off the train? It's in the woods, up in the back of the joint. Good. Let's hang this robbery on that stiff in the closet. How? Well, it's easy. Tell Chuck to switch clothes with the guy, put him in the hot car, put some of the loot in the guy's pocket, and shove the car off a cliff. Now, listen. The ticking of that clock should remind you that time is hurrying by. That this is the last time the Equitable Society will offer its famous fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers to this radio audience. Fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers? What kind of chart is that? Before I answer that question, Tom, let me ask you this. If you should die unexpectedly, what monthly income would your wife and children need to live the way you want them to? Well, I really don't know, Mr. Keating. I've often worried about what would happen to them. But I guess about all I've ever done is worry. Tom, the fact-finding chart is the first step towards ending that worry. With this chart, you'll know exactly how much money your family would require to live in reasonable comfort and security if you should be taken from them. Here, take a look at the chart. See? 
every foreseeable expense is provided for. And you're guided by easy-to-understand pictures every step of the way. In five minutes, you'll know the minimum income your family would need to keep going and to keep together during the critical years until your youngest child finishes high school. Sounds like just what the doctor ordered. Where can I buy one of those charts? You can't buy them, Tom. They're free. Phone your Equitable Society representative soon and ask him to bring you a fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Or send a postcard, care of this ABC station, to the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Your request will be forwarded to the nearest equitable representative. There's the clock again, reminding you that the time is almost up, that this is the last time the famous fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers will be offered to this radio audience by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Slapstick Holdup. That a roadhouse, which is a breeding place for crime, a roadhouse like the one in tonight's case from the files of your FBI, is allowed to exist, is not to be blamed upon either the local or the state police. For the great probability is that those law enforcement agencies are so undermanned that it is impossible for them to do the job they want to do to clean the community of any such place. It is your job as a citizen, if you too want your community free of such criminal hangouts, to see to it that your local police force is large enough to do its job. It is cheaper in the long run, and this has been proven in city after city, to have such a large force of local policemen that criminals avoid your city in their travels. Your bill last year, the bill handed to you by thieves like the ones in tonight's case, was well over a hundred million dollars. That is what the value was of properties stolen from you, the American people, And unless your communities are more adequately policed this year than they were in 1948, it is entirely possible that the bill for 1949 will be even larger. Tonight's file continues in a waiting room at Memorial Hospital in Watertown. Special Agent Landon has just entered. I got here as soon as I could, Jim. Your message didn't catch up with me until a couple of minutes ago. Oh, that's all right, Frank. Well, what are we doing here? Well, that stolen car was found by the local police. It was? Where? At the bottom of a cliff a little way out of town. A man named Guy Green was in it. We found some rings and a bracelet in his pocket. Oh. Mrs. Anderson has definitely identified the items as part of the jewelry that was stolen on the train. Well, that just about closes the case then, doesn't it, Jim? Yeah, I think so. Mr. Taylor? Oh, yes, nurse. I'm Mr. Taylor. Dr. Corday said that it was all right for you to go in to see Mr. Green now. Thank you. But please don't stay in there any longer than you have to. I won't. It's the first door on the left. Thanks again. Frank. Uh, yes, Jim? Well, I'm in talking to Green. Why don't you check with his doctor about when he'll be able to be moved out of here, huh? Okay. See you later. Yeah. Mr. Green? That's me. I'm a special agent of the FBI. Here are my credentials. Well, it's about time you guys got into this case. You mean you want to confess? Confess? What? Committing that holdup on the train and stealing the car that you drove over the cliff? I never stole anything in my life, except maybe an extra bow. How did you happen to be in that car if you didn't steal it? I don't know. Can you tell me how you happen to have had that jewelry in your pocket? No. Look, Mr. Taylor, I'm an actor. Didn't you ever hear of an act called a guy named Guy? That's me. I'm not a crook. Where were you at 8 o'clock tonight, Mr. Green? I was in a roadhouse called The Palms. I went there looking for a guy named Eddie Manley. He stole my whole act. If you're looking for a crook, arrest him. Did you see Manley? No, he wasn't there. Did you see anyone at the roadhouse? Sure. I saw a guy named Pete Craig who owns the place and a character named Ralph Harper who runs it for him. I hope you can prove that's true. Well, you're in the proving business, Mr. Taylor, not me. Yes, you're quite right. Well, I'm going out to that roadhouse now and see if your alibi is true. Yes, Ralph. 
Uh, I don't know how to tell you this, Pete. Tell me what? About the stiff we tied up in the closet. Well? Chuck changed clothes with him, like you said. We put the rings and bracelet in his pocket. Was he still out? Well, he came to for a minute, but Chuck belted him again. He was out cold when we put him in the car. Yes? Chuck got to the cliff, got out, put the bum behind the wheel, shoved the car over the edge. Well, it went okay, then. Up to there, it did. What do you mean? Two guys were fishing in the stream. They heard the noise and came running. They pulled the guy out. One of them ran a call to the hospital. How do you know? Well, pretty soon an ambulance came, and then there were some cops. Oh, that's great. I got a feeling he's still alive. Where's Chuck now? Out at the bar getting mulled. He was supposed to get cut in for 25% of this, wasn't he? That's right, Pete. Well, call him in. Give him $200 and tell him he's fired. Just a minute. Good evening. My name is Taylor. I'm a special agent of the FBI. Here are my credentials. Oh. oh, my name is Harper, Frank Harper. I'm the manager here. What can I do for you, Mr. Taylor? I'd like to talk to you about an entertainer that you have working here. Well, why don't you come into the office? It's a little drafty out here. All right, thanks. You say uh, you want to talk to me about one of my actors? That's right, a performer named Eddie Manley. He don't work here anymore, Mr. Taylor. Oh, when did he stop? Well, he was drunk when he reported for work tonight, so I fired him. I see. I'm sorry I can't help you. But tell me, Mr. Harper, has anyone else been around here tonight looking for Manley? No. I see. I'm the manager here, like I said, and if anybody wanted Manley, they'd have been sent to see me the way you were. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll admit Manley wasn't a very good comic, but I didn't think he was so bad he'd get arrested. Oh, we're not trying to arrest Mr. Manley. Oh. However, do you know where I might be able to get in touch with him? Well, he was drunk, like I told you, and I threw him out of here a couple of hours ago. Maybe you can find him in one of those other joints up the road. All right, Mr. Harper. Thanks very much. Sorry to have bothered you. Not at all, Mr. Taylor. Come back any time. I just got back here to the hospital myself, Jim. Oh, I spoke to the manager at the Palms. He denies that Green or anyone else was around tonight looking for Manley. The manager? He's the one Green claims did the slugging, isn't he? Yeah, he's the one. Huh. I don't know how much they're doing is any good, but I made some plaster casts of the tires on the stolen car that Green was found in. Oh, good. Did you go through the car? Yeah, I went over every inch of it. I thought I might find a secret compartment with the rest of the Anderson jewels. Well, there's still an awful lot of it missing. Well, almost all of it. I wonder what Green could have done with it. Oh, I haven't seen you since I checked those plastic casts I made of the bandits' footprints, have I? No, oh, why? Because I'm not so sure now that Green did the actual holdup. Well, what makes you say that? Well, the shoes he was wearing when he was brought into the hospital didn't match the footprints made by the man who jumped off the train. Besides, Green's shoes had taps built into the toes. Hmm. Well, then maybe a handkerchief I found stuck behind the front seat of the car is more important than I thought it was. Well, what handkerchief is that? This one. Both Mr. and Mrs. Anderson identified it because of the green border as the one that the bandit used for a mask. Yeah, it is important, I think. Well, it's obviously been laundered, but we'd have to send it to the lab in Washington to have them read the invisible laundry mark before we could even start to find out whose it was. Well, we haven't got that much time. It'll take about two days. Yeah, I know that, Jim. Hey, wait a minute, Frank. We're in a hospital. What more do we want? Come on, we don't have to send that handkerchief to Washington. Come on. the safe, Ralph. Let's take a look at that stuff. Sure, Pete. Did you get rid of Chuck? He wouldn't take the 200. Let him drop dead. He's out at the bar getting loaded. Probably waiting to see you. <laughs> I hope he holds his breath till I talk to him. Yeah, and, uh, 45 to the left. There you are, Pete. It's all in this bag. Fine. Let's lay it out on the desk and take a gander at it. Hey. Hey, this is good-looking merchandise. It's got to be worth 20 Gs, maybe more. Yes, sir, and I know just the guy who can handle it for us, too. There's a guy in Pittsburgh that handles some stuff. Nice-looking stuff, huh, Pete? Knock on that door before you come in here after this, Chuck. Why? Because you don't work here anymore. Okay. You can leave now. I want to talk to Ralph alone. I ain't leaving empty. You don't have to. You've got 200 coming. No dice. That's all you get. Take it and get out. Don't get so tough, Pete. 
put that cap pistol down. You want to see it go off? Don't you move either, Ralph. Why don't you stop it, Chuck? You're all boozed up. You got that whiskey courage going for you. Sure, sure, I'm loaded. Now, why don't you go home and sleep it off? Come back here tomorrow night. Ah, uh, uh, Ralph. Put that stuff back in a satchel. You better do what he says, Ralph. Okay, Pete. Yeah, that's smart, boys. That's smart. Now, close it up, Ralph. Now, stand back while I pick it up. Okay, Chuck. You too, Pete. You'll never get away with this, Chuck. Watch me. Now, stay here till I get outside. Drop that gun, Wells. Huh? Oh, no, I'm I getting said out drop it. Oh! Nice work, Jim. Take care of him. I'll get the two inside. He's a G-man, Pete. He was here before, That's huh? right, Craig. My partner and I are both special agents of the FBI. We want all three of you for attempted murder. Ralph Harper, Peter Craig, and Charles Wells each received sentences of 30 years for theft from an interstate carrier and attempted murder. Special Agent Taylor helped solve tonight's case because he remembered that invisible laundry marks can be read under ultraviolet light and that the hospital had a room equipped with ultraviolet ray machines. After contacting the correct laundry, he found that the handkerchief belonged to Chuck Wells, a known employee of Pete Craig, the owner of the roadhouse. Because that made it appear that the story told by the comedian Guy Green was true, Special Agents Taylor and Landon searched the territory surrounding the roadhouse. In the woods immediately behind the club, they found tire marks which corresponded to the plaster casts they had made of the tires on the stolen car. When Chuck Wells' shoes fit perfectly into the other plaster casts, the ones made by Special Agent Taylor at the spot where the bandit had jumped off the train, there was no longer any doubt that Guy Green had been telling them the truth. And thus, in the space of five hours, your FBI not only was able to check the careers of three desperate criminals, but it also was able to perform the job it likes best to do. It was able to clear an innocent man. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's case from the files of your FBI. But now, listen. Yes, the seconds are ticking away. Time is rushing by. So once again, let me remind you that this is the last time the Equitable Society will offer its famous fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers on this program. With this chart, you can start to make sure that your family will be well-fed, well-housed, and well-clothed, regardless of what happens to you. Phone your Equitable Society representative soon. Or send a postcard to the Equitable Society, care of this ABC station. Your request will be forwarded to the nearest representative of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A factual account of a relentless manhunt. Its subject... Murder, its title, The Fugitive Bridegroom. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry D. Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. Tonight's program was directed by Sid Goodwin. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Fugitive Bridegroom on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.